it's a real pleasure to be here. And thank you, firstly, to the Society for the invitation. And the last time I was here in this hotel was um, for the launch of this fantastic book, Loud uh, History and Society, published by Geography Publications. And again, sometime in November. Yeah. So well worth a book, well, well worth having a look at. It covers the whole history of the, of the county. Um, as Carol was saying, the, the, this, the, the actual law is really based on death and Irish for history, but with a loud twist. It's, uh, if you like, thinking about how the dead in the period between 8000 BC and 400 AD, we call Irish for history, uh, were treated by the living. And uh, I'm going to set my clock for 45 minutes. And after 45 minutes, I'm going to give up. So we'll see where we go. And as I was saying to Jean, depending on where I've got to, I can summarize the rest in a few minutes. So, but I really want to give time for people to ask questions if they want. Uh, and to, this is really to give you a flavor of what death and burial in, 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 in Loud was like over that long span of time. I should say that, um, not surprisingly, given that the topic is about death, that there are images of human skeletal remains. Some people can be sensitive about that. Um, but just to point out that, that there will be images. And all, an easy way out in terms of preparing the PowerPoint was to say that all acknowledgements and credits are in the book or as well. So as archaeologists, we have, if you have the privilege and responsibility of, of, in a sense, recovering the dead from where they're buried. And, and, it, and that is, a, 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 if you like, both a, a privilege and a responsibility. And in a way, it's with that sense that I, that I tried to, to write the book. And um, that, of course, is something that's facing us all. Uh, which again is kind of the link between the past and the present. And how we celebrate death, for example, in Ireland has changed. Uh, there's both change and continuity in our, in our own memories as to how death was celebrated. This is a picture from a funeral on the Iron Islands recorded by Bill Doyle sometime in the 1960s, I think. And it's a whole sequence of photographs of the day of the funeral. And then this modern photograph from Ghana and, and the coffin is being born, and the, the coffin is in the shape of a fish to say something about the person who's, who it contains, who's contained within it, and being born, if you like, aloft by the crowd. So different ways of thinking about the treatment of the dead. And that's the kind of perspective I think we need to bring when we're looking at prehistory, that this is something that links us to with today, but is also very different. Very, a different kind of society, a different kind of celebration. So, and also this link between the living, the, what, of course, the dead are, are buried by the living. There are these ongoing links between the living and the dead. And also then that we can try to explore the way that the dead were treated. We can look to other societies, other religions, in terms of their treatment of the dead, and think about reflect on how that might help us understand what was going on as well. This is a scene from a, a cremation and um, ceremony in Bali about 10 years ago. And um, we normally take a, when we look at Irish prehistory, we, we, we divide it into a number of periods, um, Mesolithic, Neolithic, Bronze Age and Iron Age, marked by technology and change and so on. And we subdivide that and so on. and and when we look at death, we normally tend to say, well, we'll consider death in that context. We look at the Mesolithic period, how they treated the dead, and so on. I want to do something different, say, well, what about looking at the whole period and taking death as the focus and seeing how the changes and patterns and continuities that we can see if we approach it with that perspective, rather than necessarily being bound to a particular period. So that, again, is, was, was a kind of a key approach in the book. One of the things that's, that's very clear is when you start to look at the, um, the evidence that it's clear that we're looking at the treatment of a selected minority of the, of, of the population at any time. 
that when we compare all the evidence we have in the archaeological record, we're probably talking about uh, the remains of 5,000 people for prehistory. And recognizing all the biases that go behind that, it's clear that that's vastly, it is only a small proportion of the number of people that would have been, that would have lived over that period. This is an attempt by a colleague, Rowan uh, McLaughlin, to kind of use radiocarbon dates, a dating system, to tell us about potentially the number of people who might have been living at particular periods. Mm -hmm. And you can see low levels up to the beginnings of farming, up to, he, he suggests up to maybe between one and two million people at early in, in, as farming communities were established, a bit of a peak, I sorry, a drop, and then in the Bronze Age, a significant rise, prolonged rise, and that's, we, we might come back to that, but it's certainly suggested in, by, the, by the fantastic amount of archaeological evidence we have for that period, another drop and then a rise in the early medieval period. Now, we, we could quibble about his figures. He's suggesting, as I say, figures of up towards 2 million people. And that's a, that's a big increase in what we used to think about the numbers of people in prehistory. Whatever about the detail of that, I think he's right in terms of that we have underestimated the level of population. And then at the same time, if we come to monuments, this is a court term in, in going back to Kieran's long remember <coughs> memories of court terms in, in uh, Donegal. Think about the number of people who would have been involved in constructing that, 20, 30, 40, 50 people. And the number of people we find buried in a tomb like that, that would have been in use over several generations. And in a, in a tomb like that, you, you're talking about 10, 12, maximum maybe 20 people. They're clearly going into that monument over a prolonged period of time. So it's a small proportion of the population. So we as archaeologists, I think, are looking at what has been called the kind of divisible dead. And we actually don't know how most people were buried or how, or how they were treated after death, I should put it like that. So these are people who are selected in some way and that we can then pick up in the archaeological record because they have been commemorated, because they've been placed after death in, in monuments or graves that survived for us to recover today. There's a book I, I only saw, I should have seen it before I finished this book. But anyway, it's called Making Sense of Monuments by an American archaeologist called Michael Kolb. And he has this interesting idea about that when we look at monuments, we should be thinking about three different notions of time. What he calls ancestral time, or remembering the dead, remembering our, our dead, if you like, however we construct that in terms of kin, family, friends, or whatever. He then goes on to talk about what he calls sacred time, where ceremonies take place, uh, rituals that are enactments, if you like, of beliefs take place within a monument. And then he talks about God or heroic time, where, where the past is remembered in a kind of mythic way. And very often this is tied to things like tying monuments to sunrises, sunsets, tying in a monument to the, the natural passing of the seasons and so on, to that long-lived sense of time. And I think there's a kind of, I, I'm hoping to get, I'm not going to come back to this, but I hope you, as we go through that, you get a sense that actually these aren't so much separate as kind of interwoven strands of time. And that over time, you could see as a place is used for burial, <clears throat> how what starts off as something being about the dead and the ancestors might eventually turn up to be about a heroic past, a kind of mythic past that's remembered because the monument is there, as opposed to who is in the monument. Anyway, just something to think about as we go along. And then the other thing to say about this, the selected dead, <clears throat> is that within that, we can see in some cases, a focus on particular parts of the body. And perhaps not surprisingly, a focus on the human head that we see expressed in lots of different ways. And you might say, well, that's okay, that's fine. And this is a wedge term uh, to about, to about 2500 BC. And this woman is treated in a different way and our body's put here and our, sorry, that's most of our human remains put here and our head's put here. And it looks, that's, yeah, that's very different. And we can see this treatment of the, of the head in different ways, different times of prehistory. And we have these stone heads, this one from Coilac in County Cavan. 
And you say, but then you come and we come very locally here to Drada and we have, if you like, the head of St. Albert Plunkett preserved. So this notion of the relic and the importance of bone, and particularly the head, is actually something that again provides us with a link between past and present. Okay. <clears throat> so the Mesolithic in Ireland runs from about 8,000 BC to 4,000 BC. There are in terms of earlier, we you know that people are here from about 8,000 BC. And for the first 4,000 years, 8,000 to 4,000, 4, they're living, they're hunting and gathering, they're on the move, they're organized. But it's, it's, it's basically a kind of a, a, a seasonal uh, routine where they're following resources, um, where they're exploiting particular stone resources as well. And what's interesting is that for that period of, of 4,000 years, we have the remains of about 10 people. And that may reflect the low population at the time. It may reflect the mode of burial. Um, and and some, of the, some of the remains have been found quite fortuitously. Some of them are the result of deliberate burial. For example, this is Hermitage, just north of Limerick on the banks of the Shannon, where a person was cremated on a pyre and their remains buried in this pit before 7,000 BC, and this stone axe was placed with them. And the whole remains of a person, about 1,500 grams cremated bone, which would represent kind of the, the gathering of all the cremated bone of a person is placed in this pit. And there are other, a couple, one or two other pits with similar burials placed over uh, in that area over the next thousand years or so. The bottom one is a Kinnera cave in County Limerick as well. You can see the two sides are actually close together. And here you have the deposition of, of human remains outside the cave, maybe in the inside as well, but the bones are washed in. And that's a place that's used episodically right through the Neolithic into the Bronze Age. People come back and they deposit human remains as well. Now, is that just fortuitous? Or is this because there's a kind of a story that a narrative and stories and myths that grow up about this place as an appropriate place to put the dead? The live connection is, is Rock Marshall. And this is uh, a view looking eastwards along the south coast of Cooley. Um, this is the, the main road out towards um, Carringford and Greenore there. And these are the, the grassy areas are, are um, ridges of moraine ridges, ridges left as a result of uh, the retreat of the ice. And at the time, this site was occupied between about 5,000 and 4,000 BC. And at the time, the, the sea level would have come up around the base of this hillock here, this, this ridge. And here you can see the attempt to illustrate this point. So if you imagine that scene, and this is the, the line. And then it, and, and sea level is rising at that point. And there were Frank Mitchell excavated here in, in the 1940s, and he describes three different middens, as he calls them. And in one of those, he found he, he found the classic stone artifacts of the late Mesolithic. And then he found a, a human female, um, which is dated between seven, sorry, 4700 BC and 4300 BC. Um, and so it's, as I say, it's, it's intriguing because it was the earliest find of a Mesolithic person. He's the earliest land person. Um, we know he, uh, or they were living, the, the, the kind of the isotope evidence indicates a, a kind of mixed maritime and terrestrial diet, as you might expect from people on the move and using the sea resource, the rich sea resource of this area, at some stage in the year, and then moving inland. Um, was, was that known just an accidental find? Was it carefully put there? Because we know that happens in some cases, in some Shannon sites of this period, the bones carefully put there. And I tried to capture a sense of this kind of... Uh, what might have been going on in the first in the in the book? Each of the main chapters of these different periods starts with a kind of narrative, a, a story about how a person was, or, or in this case, a bone was treated after that. And I suggest that this was a deliberate deposit. We have this elder figure and this younger girl who he's passing on knowledge to, and they're depositing this bone in somewhere like this is. The, Part of the, the remains of the of the mid, of the midden here recorded about twenty years ago. That's Trumpet Hill in the background, uh, looking westwards. 
and the kind of scene that somebody's imagined for a, for a coastal resident community of this period, and this notion that they're at a time when the sea level they know is rising, it's it's not quite the kind of climate emergency we have at the moment. Sea level is rising. There might have been a a notion of of a need to perhaps give something back, and in this case, uh, the, the deposition of human bone. It's just a, a kind of a to kind of to try and capture the humanity of what might have been going on. And then about a kilometer east of of the middens, which are here on higher, slightly higher ground, there is a, a megalithic tomb in the same town at Rock Marshall. And we're now into totally different terrain. Um, and this is looking at Rock Marshall. Uh, you can see that the long axis of this is showing the orientation of different core terms in this area. This is part of the, the chamber area. But what's interesting is that we have this juxtaposition of these two very different approaches to what would have been the remains of the dead placed in this monument, sometime around about 3700 BC. So 700 years later than the, the Rock Marshall Maiden, but close by. And um, but we're in a different world because megalithic tombs, the construction of monuments to mark the land, to place bones in the, the, the place remains of the dead in them, as it, I put it here. It's a central feature of, of the Neolithic world of Northwest Europe. The world that farmers created as they spread across Europe from the Near East has, is, is different in different parts of Europe. And, and we certainly know that a, a key characteristic of this, of our area, if you like, Northwest Europe, is this construction of megalithic tombs, marking the landscape, quarrying stone, putting up these, mo these monuments, and placing the bones of the dead in them. And now we've got four types of, of um, megalithic tomb, what are called portal tombs or portal dolmens, court tombs or court cairns, passage tombs or passage graves, and wedge tombs. And what's interesting is, that all four of these types occur in the Kuli Peninsula, which is quite unusual. And that in time terms, we can say broadly that the three portal courts and passage belong to the period that, you know, they're being built from about 3700 BC down to about 3000. And the, and the wedge terms are about 500 years later. They start about 2500 BC. So there's a kind of a, interesting reinvention of, of the megalithic tradition at the end of the Neolithic. And, and the portal tomb at, at uh, Pro Leak, as, as shown by Thomas Wright in, in, in the 18th century, as, as it is recent now. And um, why I put this on is because th this site hasn't, hasn't been excavated, but on the basis of evidence from elsewhere, it looks like portal tombs are actually the earliest megalithic monuments all put up by people in the Irish landscape. And that, that statement is based particularly on this monument. You may be familiar with the, with the photograph of Pound Brown in County Clare, excavated by Anne Lynch. And it dates to about 3000, before 3800, and about 3000 BC. So it's, it's about a hundred years earlier than anything else we know of. And in it, there are the remains of about, uh, I think it's about 36 individuals 17 or 18 adults and the rest sub-adults, everything from ch very small children to very mature adults. I suppose an interesting point is when I say mature adults, most people at this stage who lived through adulthood, to adulthood would have died in their 20s, and, uh, or, their thir 20s or 30s, but we have some older individuals surviving. Again, I suppose it's, it's interesting to say that in these kind of societies we'd expect very high infant fertility rates so a large number of children being born, but also high infant mortality rates. So, the, you know, if you, if you survive to being an adult, your, expect, your life expectancy would be 20s, 30s, and then people older than that would have been regarded as being quite elderly. But we do have people in different monuments who are, look like they're six, into their 60s, who would have, and if you think about length of generation, maybe 20, 25, 30 years, these are people who would have seen several generations passed by, and they were probably the oldest people in the community at the time. But coming back to Pound and Brown, and I'm sorry, you probably won't see the detail, but what this looks like, all these kind of 
indications here are collections of bone. And it looks like people were put in and then I, I, when put in as bodies. And then at a later stage, when somebody else was put in, their bones were shifted to one side. And that seems to have happened over multiple occasions over that sort of 800 years from 3800 to 3000 BC. And if you think about the kind of numbers that are there and that 800 years, you're probably talking about somebody being placed in there every 20, 25 years. So again, this notion that there, it's select people of a different community or communities who are ending up here. So um, that's, that's portal tombs and, and the possibility that somewhere like Pearl Lake may be the earliest monument in, in, in certainly in North Louth. And then these are core tombs, um, so-called after this open feature at the front, and then there would have been a, this would have been roofed over, and you have this very distinctive elongated, and there's a classic example there. So there's the court, the roofed area with two chambers, and then a, a, a covering area of stones. And these elements of court, burial chambers, are arranged in different ways. And there's a different type where you've got effectively two terms, sorry, two sets of chambers facing each other across an open court. And I've tried to capture this. This is body glass in County Mayo. And um, I'm hoping that's the light. Yeah, you get, I hope you can see that as a, a house for the living that was, was covered over and, and replaced by this house for the dead. Uh, as I say, sometime between 3,700 and about 3,500 BC. And again, I've tried to capture this notion of, in the book about somebody being, being buried here. And it kind of echoes this notion that there might be a connection in people's head with this being a place that they knew from the past when somebody, our families had lived in, in the house itself. And now it was becoming a house for the dead. Now, there's something uh, very different or very interesting happens. Um, we used to say that this kind of monument passes terms going on, on, on the Boyne Valley and so on. We, we, we very much focused on the, the period, the centuries before 3000 BC, say from 3400 to 3000 BC. But recent evidence suggests that, in fact, the tradition of building passage terms like this one at Sleeve Gullion. Um, it certainly goes back to 3,600, if not a little bit earlier. So the, so the idea is, is kind of contemporary with, with core terms at least. But over time, these monuments become more elaborate. And in the case of the Boyne Valley, as we see, we've got enormous passage terms being built. But it's interesting that passage terms are somewhere we get in, 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 in Cooley and then all in, down at the southern end of the county in, in the Boyne Valley. And so Gwynion was excavated in the 1960s, very little survives, but what's interesting about it is its location, this amazing um, location at, at, the, at, the, um, at this point up here on the top of Sleep Gwynion. And then its orientation, this is a photograph taken by Ken Williams, and um, it shows the sunset at, at winter solstice, and this is facing as well down towards Loch Crewe. So at winter solstice sunset, you see the sun setting, obviously, but it's setting behind Loch Crewe. So a couple of really interesting things here, this connection with other passage terms that are long distances away, and with these celestial events that bring us back to this notion of sacred time as well as ancestral time. And um, we see that reflected in a different way This is Claremont Cairn before an old photograph before the, the communication mass was, was put up. Um, and what's interesting about Claremont Cairn is, is it doesn't have any astronomical alignment. But when you're standing at Four Locks near the north in, in, in um, south of us here, and you're looking from the entrance at Four Locks, what's right in your vision is the Cairn on, on Black Mountain. So there's a kind of connection here between monuments that are far distant. And I suppose the other reason I wanted to bring in Four Locks was because, I, it, to me, it's a fantastically evocative monument. It's not in County Lyles, unfortunately. But um, this notion that we're dealing with a different kind of monument, that as passage terms develop, this idea of being able to move inside, 
through a passage, then this big exterior, interior space, and then burial chambers off it. It's a different sense. Remember this notion of sacred time as opposed to ancestral time. This is somewhere you could actually carry out activities, not just outside, but inside. And then, of course, you have this, that spatial arrangement. The, the significant spaces in significant spaces indicated by by uh, engraved slabs, and then the placement of the dead within. In this case, both in the in the chambers and then also in the passage, as as the, the passage was sealed up. But if if we come to the south of the county, it's really in the Boyne Valley that we see this the the, the the highest expression, if you like, of the of the passage time phenomenon. There is a loud connection in that. This is the the, the county boundary, so Townley Hall, a small tomb there that's orientated on. Uh, summer solstice sunrise, if I've got it right, uh, is, is allowed. And then the, you have the, ma the main focus of the complex around the three large sites at Nath, Newgrange and Delth, and the extraordinary new discovery east, east of Delth and Delth Hall recently. And then the, the kind of the elaborateness of the sites both outside and then the different spaces that you encounter as you move around inside and key places indicated by different depictions of Mega the Gart, and this one from uh, Northwest. And again, another very important Laos connection is that it looks like the grey wacky, the sandstone that forms the major structural stones, particularly for Nelson and Newgrange, in all likelihood seems to uh, probably comes from Clara Head, which is shown on the left. And then the sources for the other stones shown on the map the granite diet and, and, and granite and so on, sitstone coming from the Cooley Peninsula further north, from the, ultimately from the Moors, and the quartz, mm -hmm. arguably both from Wicklow and possibly uh, George Vastapoulos, who was the geologist who studied the material at Nath, arguing that it might have come, the quartz might have come from Rockabill, hence why it's been depicted here. And, it, and in a sense, then we're seeing these various bits of landscape these geological sources being brought together to create a, a, a monument. And that in itself indicates the scale of activity that must have been going on, both in terms of the quarry, the transport of material, the numbers of people who must have been involved in the construction of these monuments. Now, of course, you um, the, the question of the dead in, in, in passage terms has come to the fore recently through the um, a DNA, the um, ancient DNA results from Newgrange in particular, this particular individual who seems to um, be the result of a, a family link, you know, very, very close family linkage. And the sense that this may, may give a kind of a, a notion of royalty to, to what was going on, that's kind of shown here in this image from the front of nature work by Laura Cassidy and colleagues in, in Trinity. And I think that's important and interesting. But what, what's really much more interesting in a way is the sense that there are links between different terms. And also that the individual at, at, at Newgrange, I think we have to see him, and it's a him, in the context of the complexity of what was going on in the treatment of the dead in passage terms. And that it's not just a, a, the placement of a body in a tomb, but there's a very complex post-mortem treatment of human of, of people after death, and that involves both burning people in cremation, and then also having unburned remains mixed in with cremation deposits, particularly of the head. And this is this um, image is from one of the cysts at, at the Mount of the Hostages at Tara, and you can see the unburned human heads and surrounded then by cremated remains. And another if you like, the picture of that this is from the eastern tomb at Nelth, and the um, this this recess here. And just to, I'm sorry if you can't see the the detail, but it's, it's basically just showing that there is a mixture of cremation and inhumation. There's adults, there's children, and we don't know if these when you've got cremation and inhumation are they different individuals? Are they different? Are they parts of the same person being treated in different ways? It's a really complex treatment of the dead going on here. And that's an attempt to kind of capture that on the left. Um, so this, 
if you think about a, a human skull being deposited in a tomb, well, there's, there's a process that has to go behind that. The body has to decay. Uh, the bone has, you have to be able to get access to the, to the cranium of the skull or the skull. Was, was the rest of the person cremated or was there separate treatment for different people? And then their bones are brought together and so on. Very complex issues here that are, st that are still being resolved. But alongside that, you have this notion that this, this formal deposition of material, there's, there's a range of objects that tend to occur with the dead in past terms. But I just want to focus on this notion of, at, at Newgrange, this the idea that the quartz was a wall. At Nels, George Irwin thought that the quartz was deposited like this, in front, this is part, close to the eastern tomb at, at entrance at Nels, where you have these areas of um, kind of settings edged by grey wacky, and then you have the quartz, and then you have the granite diorite and the diorite in between. And of course, you have deposition of objects like this, this, this mace head with this human face on it. So I, I think a very definite link back to the notion of, of people, of, of, in this case, creating megalithic art in some sense to bring us closer to the notion of a person being represented in the mace head. If we think about this question about time as well, what's interesting about Mouth is that you can see over 700 years the way in which the monument complex develops and changes. And I just wanted to, and I think it, 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 it's, it's worth focusing on this just for a few moments. So the, the, some of the smaller sites around the main tomb at Mouth are clearly, <coughs> excuse me, earlier than it. And this is Mouth 16. And if you look at the design of the process term, so this is the main mount, um, this is the, the edge of the main mount, and so this has been truncated so that you now have to come in from the side into the passage. So they've, they've altered the monument to make allowance for the construction. After this was built, the main term was built. And this is what it looks like from this point here, you're looking in, the structural stones, the roof is gone, but all of this around the edge are actually quiet pieces of grey wacky. So they, used, they were working grey wacky on the site as well as, as bringing it in large lumps of blocks from the quarries and then working it on site. And then you have these, you can probably see best in this one, these, these deposits of cremated bone. And what's interesting is that they are incorporated into the monument. So as this, these, this chamber area was being filled up, was actually being constructed, there was a cremation deposit put in and covered by stone, then another cremation deposit. So the bone, if you like, is fused with the stone of the monument to make that monument what it is. The bone is actually becomes part of the monument. And I think that's, that's significant. It's not just a place for the dead, it becomes a place of the dead, a place where the dead reside, if you like. And then coming after the the, the main mound, which we know was built sometime between, or used, so should it say, and expanded between about 3,300 and 3,000 BC. There's a, there are interesting things that happen after that. And it, it used to be that we talk about this, the grooved wire structure, which I'll show you in a second, as something different to the passage term, something that things changed, the world changed after 3,000 BC. And there was a focus now on these smaller structures uh, and the re if you, I'm sure most of you have been to now, and you see this structure here reconstructed as a, as a timber circle. And here's another one at at at, uh, at Benny's town. And of course, on a, on in in the Balgathering north of us here, there's three of these small structures. And there's another one at, at, at there are a couple more in the area of Lagavulin south of the Boyne as well. And this is what grooved wire looks like. So it's interesting is that it's a much larger pot. That people would have been using up to this time. And that brings about this notion of well, what was it been used for? Is this about larger numbers of people coming together? And it may well be that. But what's what's interesting about what recent research has shown is that in fact there are burials of this date after 3000 BC in smaller tombs at Nath, in one of the large tombs at Nath. And when we come to the old DNA evidence, the, the, the DNA evidence extracted from individuals from different Passage terms, not only do they show the links between these different passage terms, for example, places like Millen Bay up in, in, uh, in County Down, 
Carol Keel in County Sligo, Newgrange, that there are these genetic linkages between the individuals, but also that those genetic link linkages span what we used to call the passageum period and the Grudra period, that in fact, there are individuals that show genetic linkage crossing the so-called cultural divide. So people who are in some way linked are continuing to use these places, even though they're not building passages in terms anymore, they're still using them. I think that's a really important result of the new ANA work, DNA work. Okay, well, <clears throat> talking about uh, ancient DNA, at a European level, it has been suggested that what we call the Chalcolithic or the Copper Age, starting about 2500 BC, is a period of major change. And genetic work that has been done in Western Europe suggests that this major replacement of people at that time ultimately coming from further east. Now, we're not quite sure of the situation in Ireland at the time because there's ongoing work in ADNA, which hasn't been published yet. Um, but what we can say is that the, the kind of pottery that is being used over wide area Western Europe at that time, beaker pottery, which you see depicted here, we certainly get that in Ireland from about 2450 BC down to about 2000. And the classic beaker burial elsewhere in Europe is a single burial accompanied by one or more of these pots. And you see an example from up here in, in Scotland, this lady buried here, with the two beaker pots behind her and a little baby. And that's a classic rite of, of beaker burial. We don't have that classic rite in Ireland, but the, and the nearest we have to this burial from uh, Mel, where there's a woman placed very, you know, the skeleton was shown exactly in a similar way on her right side. Um, this dates to about 2000, I think it's about 2400 uh, BC. Not placed with a pot, but in an exactly similar position to this lady from Scotland. So it's tempting to suggest that the date ties in, the style of burial ties in. There are beaker burial, sorry, there are beaker pots from pits nearby this burial, even though there wasn't one placed with her. And then coming back to a point I mentioned earlier, where we do find beaker burials in Ireland are in wedge tombs. And remember, passage tombs, high point, around about 3,000, then they stop being built. Even though people are going back to them, the same people are doing other activities there. And then 500 years later, people begin to, 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 to build the last of the four types of major tomb, these wedge tombs. And so-called because they're wider at the front, they're at the back, they're higher at the front, narrow at the back. This notion that they consistently face to the, the southwest. Most wedge tombs occur in southwest Ireland, but they do occur in areas of Northern Ireland as well. And by that I mean the, the northern third of Ireland. And up in Cooley at Proleek, about 80 metres away from the uh, the, uh, the, pass the the Port of Dalman, is a, is a wedge tomb. And then a, pad a paddock, so quite close to Monster Bryce, up on the, on the high ground there. But on its totally on its own, in a sense, a very interesting example of a, a wedge tomb on its own in this area at, at Paddock. Uh, neither of these sites have been excavated, but what's interesting is that when we look at, this is Barry Breast in County Tyrone, but there's a, a very interesting complex of, of monuments, court terms and wedge terms. And the Barry Breast wedge term contained a number of beakers, cremation deposited about eight individuals. Um, and nearby, a couple of hundred meters away, this may be the same people, somebody, but around the same time, into an existing monument that had been there for a thousand years, this Bally Breeze courtroom. Somebody dug a hole in the cairn. They put a beaker in it and put the cremation remains of an individual in that pit as well. So there's this notion of a kind of a, a very strong sense of link back to the earlier, much earlier traditions. And so this notion of reinvention, I think, is very appropriate. And very often as well, as I say, like at Proleek, wedge terms in this area are placed close to monuments that were already long there. Now, in terms of, of burial practice, we could sketch out a very complex picture of what happens in the centuries before 2000 BC, but I'm going to kind of leave that sketching out the background to this very distinctive early Bronze Age tradition and focus on, on, on the tradition itself. And we can say that 
in the early Bronze Age period from about just before 2000 BC to about 1500 BC is, in terms of the burial record, is, is by far the most significant period in terms of the record we have for, an, for a number of reasons. We have about 600 cemeteries dating to this period, so these are scatter, scattered across the country. They're local foci for burial, but not everybody. Again, it's a selection of people because they are in use in over multiple generations. Cemeteries normally contain maybe 20 people, very unusually to get more than 20. Um, the dead are buried, particularly with pots, and the style of pots varies over time. The way the dead are buried varies. They're initially buried as bodies, and then cremation becomes more important. They're sometimes placed with other remains, with other objects as well. The placement of graves within cemeteries seems to be important. People are buried in relation to each other. Graves are sometimes reused. So I hope you get a sense that this is a trying to unravel all this is quite a, an interesting and, and, and complicated story. We often describe the period in contrast to the megalithic terms as one of single burials, like this uh, individual from near uh, Derry. And, um, but in fact, in many cases, there are, there are more than one person in a tomb like this. And, and that's what I was trying to depict in this diagram on the, on the right-hand side. So, for example, I'm, I'm sorry to be missing the top. This is Old Town in County Kildare. But this woman is buried as a crouch. She was placed in a crouch position in the grave on her, uh, on her left side. And then over her knees was placed the cremated remains of an adult male. So the two people are going in to the same grave, treated in a very different way. So there's something very important, if you like, being established by that relationship. And of course, remember, this is being done by the living. So the living are also involved in this process of making these links in terms of the living, the dead, where they're traveling to in the afterlife, why it was appropriate to treat two individuals in such different ways and put them in the same grave. And of course, in some cases, these cemeteries, like with wedge tombs, they kind of hark back to the past. This is Ogden Ski in, in uh, just on the north, just near um, Ravensdale, as you're on, on the west side of the, 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 the A1 or the motorway, as it's called, where there's a number of, 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 um, of negative tombs in this area, excavated by Eston Evans in the 1930s. And what he found was a small Bronze Age cemetery. Whereas the, where the cairn of the, the original portal term, built, remember, 3,800, maybe 3,700 BC, some 1,800 years later, people go back and they convert it or make it this ancient place into an early Bronze Age cemetery with, with food vessels and cremations in these small graves. And um, also in this, so this is, for our interest tonight, I suppose the, the diamond on the right is more interesting in that this is Carmore, west of north of, of northwest of Dundalk, excavated during the, the construction of the motorway in that area. And it, it's a cemetery that seems to be in use from, as I say, around 2000 BC. And in fact, in this case, down to 1400, 1300 BC, so 700, six, 700 years. And it, there's an early stage of burial here where the burials are in cysts, and then a later stage where the burials are in pits. And then you get these little ring barrows or ring ditches here where you would have had a, a ditch dug around, maybe a barrel, a low mound placed over the center with these cremation pits in the middle, and a larger example here. So in a sense, we're, we're seeing all that pattern of variation that I've talked about going on in this cemetery, in this location. Um, not all the site was dug. There are about the remains of 16 individuals here, mostly cremations from, from uh, Karen Moore. But what's interesting is that it takes us, it, it's one of the examples where, unlike Edmundstown and Keynote, that I'm sure, uh, Keynote near Dundalk, near Dunique, and Edmundstown in South County Dublin, there are about 26 individuals in both of these cemeteries. And, and again, they show interesting variations 
really why I talked about it in the book was because what we could describe as a kind of the, the key, perhaps founding first burial in the in the cemetery, we, we can locate at Keynote certainly it looks like this one. And at, at uh, Edmundstown, it looks like this one. They're buried in a very similar style. That's the 45 minutes. So I'll just finish this and then I'll stop. They're buried in a very similar way. But uh, the one at Keynote, this is a woman and this is a man. So this notion of the people are operating within kind of frameworks of the, the right way to do things and the appropriate way to treat the dead. But how that happens and who's celebrated, if you like, in death and how they're celebrated varies enormously between all these cemeteries, that each of these cemeteries is different. And, and in a sense, what's interesting about Carmore is that it takes us beyond that into the next phase of the later Bronze Age with these very simple pit cemeteries at the end, which, which kind of marks a, a key change in burial practice. And I'm quite happy to stop at that point because it's a good place, because burial practice changes quite dramatically. I can summarize the rest of prehistory in a few minutes. The short summary. So what happens after this very dramatic period in terms of the archeological record, when we can see these very visible burials and these cemeteries, is that traditionally as archaeologists, we, we, we kind of suggest that something happened in that the burial record for the later part of the Bronze Age looked much simpler. And there were these pits, and sometimes they occurred in ring barrows, but sometimes a lot, in a lot of cases, you've got these pit cemeteries. And it looks quite different. It's vague. Sometimes you get shards of pottery with the, with the, with the burial, sometimes not. But again, when, and uh, particularly through um, the work of osteoarchaeologists like Lorraine Buckley, for example, it's become obvious that it, the record is actually much more complex. And that, yes, maybe it's only token remains of people that are being put in these pits. But what happens before those cremated remains are put in the pit is actually seems to be the focus of activity. The treatment of the person on the pyre, the dispersal of bones from the pyre, some of them ending up in pits, but in other cases, seemingly dispersed much more widely over the landscape. So we see, we find cremated bone in a whole range of different locations in the later Bronze Age and into the Iron Age. So it's a, it's a kind of much more dispersed sense of the role of the dead and the relationship to the living. But a key part of this as well is that the use of these ring barrows. And, and ring barrows become a kind of a linking team. We have these simple pit barrows in the middle, in some cases, no pit barriers, but the, the barriers are the, 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 the enclosed areas seem to be used for other purposes. But we can see the emergence of what we call barrow cemeteries or ring barrow cemeteries as dating to this later part of the Bronze Age into the Iron Age. And for example, on the, the um, uh, up near Cullen Mount Royal and the adjoining hills, there are a series of small barrow cemeteries that develop in this period into the Iron Age. And of course, the classic example is Atara. Uh, you start off with the burial of the hostages as a passage term that turns into an early Bronze Age cemetery. And then in turn, you have spread out across the hill of Tara, a barrow cemetery that takes us from that sort of around about 1500 BC down to the time the first large raw nerie is, is created in the first century BC. And that it probably is the vital link in terms of explaining why Tara becomes such a key place in early in late prehistory, early uh, history. Um, so Ring Barrows is a team that takes us right into the Iron Age. And then, I'm, I'm careful of my 10 minutes, and cremation continues as a key right from that switch over in the Bronze Age right through into the, um, the early centuries. But then from the last few centuries, we see inhumation returns. And we, um, well, that's the, the standard picture. And we start to see crouch burials. And uh, so where, where, where does that right of inhumation? Does it reemerge? Does it come in from outside? What, why are people start? Why at Nerds, for example, do we have an Iron Age cemetery of inhumations? And there are, I think there are different ways of looking at that. Yes, there's certainly influence coming in at that, st at that stage. There's a lot of contact with Britain. 
last few centuries BC, first few centuries AD. But also, I think we've underplayed probably, if we go back and look at the late Bronze Age and into the Iron Age, there are actually inhumation burials there that might provide us also with an understanding of where this re-emergence seems to come from in the last century, few centuries BC. That, that there is actually, alongside the standards of cremation, inhumation continues. And I suppose if there was one thing I'd emphasize from the record is that we shouldn't see cremation and inhumation as opposed rights, that they actually, in many cases, as I've tried to demonstrate, occur together. Yes. And there are, they are, they, they, there are different ways of treating the dead. And very often they were used in combination. The final point I'd say is that, that it, the first millennium AD, this return of inhumation, and then uh, what, we, what we might call extended inhumations from, from the, the third, fourth century AD, all seems to happen before the formal beginnings of Christianity. So these complex changes of terms of burial practice are in place when Christianity starts to come in. And the burial story for that period from about three, four, 400 AD for the next couple of hundred years, so the period when Christianity is becoming established in Ireland, is actually, again, very complex because we see ancient places of burial continuing in use. We see new family cemeteries established where inhumations take place. And this is all happening alongside, and in some cases distinct from, the beginnings of Christianity. So there are really complex patterns going on where, if you like, continuity, change, adoption of a Christian-style burial, but the formal creation of Christian cemeteries and, and the placement of most people in, these, in those Christian cemeteries probably doesn't come into place until after 800 AD. And what's interesting, and the final thing I'd say is no, it's not, is that while that's going on, people are still continuing to use family, what we would, might call family cemeteries, and cremation is also continuing use alongside inhumation. So a complicated story. And I hope that gives you some sense of what happened after the, after the Bronze Age. And all in seven minutes. <laughs> <laughs>